Hi, and welcome to Antiques Masterclass. Today, I've got John Bly here talking about the history of furniture part three. John, thank you very much for coming on All again. Right. Um, absolutely fascinating so far. And um, today, we're going to talk about Victorian. Victorian. Well, yeah, that basically it, the 19th century it, um, it, after 1830. It's a very complicated subject. Um, so I think what we should do is to cut it into two parts, okay. right? Pre-1860 and post-1860. What I'd like to do first is to cover everything that was going to, we're going to look at. And I don't know how far we're going to get today, but we'll get as far as we can. And if we have to make another one, well, we'll carry on then. The main thing is that pre-1860, it was new invention, it was new materials, new production, new ideas, new everything. And, and it was all experimentation. And coupled with this at the same time came the new machinery which would allow industrial production. So post-1860 was a period when all the new designs and all the new materials and all the new fashions could be enjoyed by everyone except the really poor people because machine production enabled it to be less expensively produced. In fact, we could have cheap furniture, cheap material, cheap everything, as well as expensive. So it divided not only in style, but also in quality. And there were layers upon layers. Whereas in the 18th century, you had like two layers yep. for the rich or the poor, mm -hmm. and you had one style which was predominant, and then it changed within 15 years, and it was another style. Now you just get another style, add it on, add it on, add it on, and add it on. So you evolve, layer after layer. Evolve. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fascinating period. But of course, it, it's where we get what we take for granted today. Nearly all came from the 19th century. Mm. So let's look at, can we have a few pictures? Um, uh, just to go back to what we were talking about in the last one, just to uh, sort of a little fresher. What do I press here? I think press the side one there. Hey, that one. Well, that's very good, isn't it? <laughs> <What the? laughs> yes. I mean, I'm used to a magic lantern with smoke coming out the project. <laughs> we had, if you remember, we got as far as the French taste, yep. which came in after the 1820s, 1825. And we also looked on this particular table, there was a tablet set in the, in the column at the top, which showed a diamond mark. That's right. This was introduced in the 1840s, as, as a sort of control of, of all the new ideas showing the patent. And we showed the chart, and you can tell the day of the month of the year when the patent was registered. Mm -hmm. Not when it was made, but when the patent was registered. So the French taste carried on until the 1850s. And here you can see it in what I think is probably one of my favorite little pieces of early, really early Victorian furniture, about 1830s. 1839, I mean, really only just into her uh, reign. And the proportion is beautiful. It is distinctly 19th century, but it, it, it is very French looking. Yeah. This was what we call franglaise, a lovely little satin wood chair, part of a set of six with the original covering on, a sort of maquette velvet, um, and that nice sort of gingery, uh, orangey tone. Just a lovely, lovely model, which soon got if I say bastardized, with all sorts of other influences, which we'll look at in a minute. But that's typical franglaise pre-1850, OK? Here you've got a, a little cabinet, another franglaise piece, a little display cabinet. Here you can see the designs of the Louis coming in. If here. I'd looked at that, I'd say it was French. You would just instantly say well, it was it, French. Yeah, but it's just made in England. Yeah. But, okay. but it is very, very French. We spent the last 500 years not liking the French, and copying everything, everything they, they did, because yeah. they're so classy. So that you can date pre-1860 by its simplicity and its elegance. It's just a very nice copy of a bit of French furniture. Walnut veneers, burr walnuts, uh, ormolu pure string, ormolu mounted. Now, in fact, these were bronze mounts, i.e. Uh, bronze and then mercurially gilded. The later ones and the less expensive ones, of course, were brass, yeah. not bronze. So shouldn't really and the quality, be You can tell by the quality oh, when you look sure. closer. You can just tell. Yes. I mean, don't forget, each one of those is cast in a mould, then it's chased, mm. then it's gilded. And mercurial gilding, of course, is, is just wonderful because mm. you can highlight it, you can burnish it. Uh, basically, gold and mercury are mixed together, form an amalgam, painted onto the surface of the metal, which is then heated to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and the mercury evolve, uh, uh, dissolves, evaporates, 
and you're left with the gold firmly fixed to the surface. Of course, it's illegal. Now, now yes. their life expectancy was quite limited <laughs> for, the, was a bit, yes. <laughs> for the Mercury. Not a job you'd aspire to, <laughs> yeah. really, no. Um, but, but the brass anyway. ones are a lot more clunky, and you, yeah. the quality's not there. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. And you can see the finished edges, as you say, more clunky. Mm. Yeah. I should remember that. Sorry. I quote you. <laughs> um, now, we got to the new materials. And you remember last time we looked at Berlin needlework, first introduced from Gotha in Germany, a complete needlework kit which was basically silk, the first patterns, by Wilkes of Absolutely. Regent Street, 1813. By the 1820s, wool was used. And uh, everybody was doing wool works. Absolutely. And you can date that by the number of different materials. By 1850, was we it were like sewing... Were they patterns? So they're like yes. painting by numbers? So you'd, Absolutely. You'd have the patterns and then so they would printed. do the needlework. Yeah. And mother and daughter would do that and then they'd get it upholstered. That's that. it. Yeah. You could use it for whatever you wanted. So Screens. they felt like they were part of the furniture that they've... They've had, it ma they've had it made, but they get yeah. it upholstered with something that they, right. they've made. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So you get this. This is a particularly nice rosewood frame seat. This would have been part of a set. Nursing chair? Uh, no, it's grandma's chair. Grandma, well, grandma's, it's chair. grandma's chair. Yeah. Then grandfather would have a slightly bigger, bigger one. one. Okay. There'd be six parlour chairs and a three-seater settee. I used to buy those sets for a pound for the set. 1957-58 for a set and I'd keep them store them up in a shed and sell them for one pound ten shillings a set <laughs> really? two Italian buyers used to come over and, ship them over. and my father said uh, why have we got a store full of, of uh, Victorian furniture because I mean, you didn't do that it was awful he was quite ashamed you know and uh, I said all well, the Italians come over he said one day they're not going to come over and they haven't paid you for the last lot yet no no they always pay when they come see for the next lot and of course, one day they didn't come anymore. I it. had a shed full of furniture for five years. <laughs> then they all sold in the end. But that was that's exceptional quality, 1840 to 1860, and a home home done Berlin needlework panel and upholstery. Just a great example. Had this been after 1850 to 1860, there would have been probably beads, glass beads involved, okay. pieces of metal, stump work. The more varied the pattern and materials, the later. The later, the later absolutely. absolutely. So good, we've got good point for the viewers to, 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 to keep an eye on. Yeah, yeah. And the same with papier mache. We mentioned that yeah. first introduced or developed by Henry Clay in the late 18th century. Developed then by a company called Jennings and Betridge. If you see their name on the back of a salver or a tray or any piece, that it's always the best. And as soon as you see a bit of, of uh, Mother Jennings of Pearl... And, Jennings and Betridge. Jennings and Betridge. J-E-N-N-E-N-S and Betridge. OK. Yeah. Um, this little caddy. Well, it's quite a predominance of black. Um, the best ones, of course, have a, a, as much colour as possible. And slightly Eastern look to it. Now, this is the designs that we'll see coming from our empire, our growing empire. Does it look slightly Moorish, Islamic? Sort of, yeah, sort of, yeah. Well, crusade, of, sort of a crusade sort absolutely. of feel Absolutely. Well, it. think of the Durbar room in Onslow, uh, Osborne House, Queen Victoria's place on the yeah. Isle of Wight. They had, she had the Durbar room, and this was a sort of after that effect. I, I was, I was honoured to go to Frogmore House, which is just by Windsor absolutely. Castle. Yeah. And, in, and in Frogmore House, they have a whole room, which is just Victorian paper mache trays, tables, yeah, and, yeah. and everything's Happy black with mother of pearl and, yes. and brightness in there, which I was... I was really 1832 impressed. was the first recorded date of mother of pearl being inlaid into the surface. A man called George Soter, S-O-U-T-E-R, uh, developed. It's actually, it's only the tiniest little skin, Slipper, yeah. but it looks as if it's very deep because of the nature of the mother of pearl. So, after 1832, mother of pearl, um, then they developed new methods of, of, of manufacture. Cheap pulped paper was used. Uh, in Australia, they even made a village out of papier-mâché. It clever. didn't last very, very long, because <laughs> it rained. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Australians learn from their yes, mistakes. Then, really. We won't go into that right now. But, but by the 1860s, they were producing pulped paper with... Uh, this is a paper rack, uh, with all the sort of late Victorian, Georgesque, Georgian-esque ideas on. But you can see the crackleur on the, the lacquer. 
This was Will that be printed the, or painted. That's printed. Printed. Yeah. It's the, the lowest end of the market. Yeah. And as with everything, once any everybody could afford it, the the wealthy people didn't want it. Yeah. It went out of fashion. Right. It disappeared. It disappeared. So those are our new uh, developments of, of manufacture and Tunbridge where We also looked at that quite briefly, and I remember I showed you how it was made out of the end of a, yeah. a, a, a block of matches, if you like, yeah, yeah. cut like a, with a bacon slicer, and then you get, this is the end result, literally the end result. Some, little, some Tunbridge wear now is worth a lot of money, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, particularly the tiny bits, stamp boxes and things like that. Mm. But um, it's, it's a highly collectible thing. The nice thing about it is there's enough of it to supply a market. You know, if you get something terribly rare, it's, it's quite difficult mm. to sell. It may be very rare. Yeah. If it's unique, it's impossible. It's very possible. difficult. Yeah. Nobody knows about it. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So there's enough of this Tunbridge where to create a market. And you can start modestly. You know, you can start with a few pounds and buy a simple little piece or relatively plain piece with just a single band of Tunbridge wear, and then develop and grow. And as you grow, you learn. And as you learn, you buy one piece and discard three, yeah. you know, and, and, and increase the quality of the collection. Glove box is always very useful, uh, not for gloves anymore, but for cars or whatever. But just a nice geometric box. So we've covered uh, basic new materials. One more that we haven't looked at is, is of course, uh, cast iron came in the Regency period, um, and you'll see it in Bath, Buxton. Coldbrookdale's like Cold the... Coldbrookdale, exactly. The, they're, the, they're the big makers, yeah. aren't they? Iron Bridge at Coldbrookdale. Yeah. Nice little stamp at the bottom there. If you've got a garden bench by Coldbrookdale, it's worth, oh, some, sure. worth a few thousand there, yeah. isn't it? So. And the important thing is that it, it, it was the basis for all the Victorian coat stands, hat stands, and miniature gardens that people had in their new flats. Mm-hmm. What we have to remember, too, is that where we talk about the little terraced houses with, with uh, you know, mini gardens and little uh, pottery places for, for potting up greenhouses and so forth. This all came about because the population doubled in two generations. Mm-hmm. In 1800, there were nine million people lived in England. That's less than in London. Yeah. By 1850, there were 18 million. Wow. And it just doubled again. And so the production was there. 50,000 people were involved in the furniture industry alone. 50,000, but I think there's about 5,000 now. Wow. You know, so it's a terrible, just totally different atmosphere. Mm. And production, we were producing and exporting all over the world, as well as importing. Frantic, a wonderful Young time. Young working class moving forward with, oh, yeah. with income, yeah. therefore yeah. they can spend the money on. Absolutely. So now let's look at, at some sort of inventions and things that were, were great fun. Um, this, they, they were starting to register their names. You, in the 18th century, you don't get makers' names on very many things. In the Victorian time, everybody stamped everything. Yeah. Everybody Painted put their name on. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is Mr. Dawes' patent reclining chair. And you pressed a couple of levers mm. under here, right? And, and the whole thing sort of just went backwards. What do I do now? Ah, there you are. Whoops, 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 whoops. Calm down, calm, calm down. down. Point it into that, that way. way yeah. I'll point it over there. There. We're doing well now, aren't well, we? Well, that's okay. It's this is just we've, recapping. We've talked about this one. Yes, we have. No, we did talk about this. This is Mr. Dawes. <laughs> Mr. Dawes' patent chair. Okay. And when you press these buttons here, then it should go back. And this Very shot nice. forward. Yeah. So you know, sort of. There's nothing new, is there? No, no, they've got them all now. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Except this wasn't electrically operated. But I tell you what, that's an extremely comfortable chair. I'm sure it is. Um, the other thing, of course, that affected furniture industry forever was the wood carving machine. And this was introduced and patented by Thomas B. Jordan, 1850, 18, sorry, 1840. Seven, I think, 1846 or seven. And this, for the first time, enabled one man to operate three carving tools, as you can see there. Yeah. So whereas in the 18th century and up until the 1840s, we'd had line production. So there would be a whole line of men sitting at a bench, Thank simply you. making the uprights to a chair or carving the top rail of a chair. And then they'd pass it on and the next people, the person would do the next bit and so on. This enabled one man to carve three chairs, legs, or three chair tops at the same time. Same. And soon, of course, it was a dozen. And then it was true mass production. And, and, and the effect was incredible, incredible. 
And so for the first time now, we see carving like this. That's machine carving. And that was the decoration on all those hundred, tens of thousands of balloon back chairs, mm -hmm. which, as I said earlier, started life with that little French one yeah. and ended up just a balloon back like this. It's not bad quality. Of course, it came in varying qualities. The, the quality of this carving, this is a bit sort of plasticky, but the quality determines the price today. And remember, too, that we've got new types of upholstery. There's a set of balloon back chairs. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, they're not bad ones. They're, you know, they're not bad. They're not very saleable now because they're not really that. I mean, you wouldn't last, or well, that wouldn't last with you in it very long. No, no, no. They, they break they're not and, practical. Yeah. They're not practical. And they cost now so much to reupholster. No. Well, they cost more to reupholster than they actually cost to buy almost oh, sure. now in auction. Yeah. I mean, we have a, a set of all right, a set of six Victorian chairs, balloon back chairs. They only make sort of two hundred pounds, hundred and fifty pounds now for a set of six. Whereas even ten years ago, it would make oh, three, three, three to five hundred, four hundred pounds plus. You know, regency. Oh, a set of regency chairs are very rare. So a set of regency chairs will make a couple of thousand plus now, but Victorian chairs. Sure. But when you say two thousand now, they were ten thousand. Of course. Worth a thousand pounds a chair, yeah. but not anymore. So times are different. Um, so the quality does determine the, the price. There's good quality carving. That's a nice quality bit of carving. And that would be machine done as well. That's machine done. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, again, sort of 18, 1860, 1860 ish. Now the whatnot. The whatnot. And to get some idea, look at this pattern book. This is an you amazing hold. book John's brought along here, ladies and gentlemen. It's called Modern Furniture, Plain <laughs> and Decorative, uh, in all good local bookstores, not. Um, but no, he's, he, it's fantastic here. And it's got, here is the whatnot we're looking at. I believe it's this one here, isn't yeah. it? And it was, it, was it was published in 1862. And this is the Bible for um, sure. manufacturers of, of Victorian furniture. And if you just flick through, you'll see everything that you see. All the different types of whatnots. And mirrors. Look at these. Console, cons There's everything. console it, mirrors. Just imagine that that is one company. One company's album, one company's catalogue. Amazing. And there were dozens of these companies. And there, are, here's, a list, here's a look at all the sofas and yeah. nursing now chairs. Now look, look at the upholstery. Now what do you notice there? Deep well, buttoning. Deep buttoning, yes. Deep buttoning. That was totally new. If you, if you look at an 18th century chair, the chair seat is upholstered with the webbing going over the rails and the minimum amount of upholstery is put on to accentuate, to draw attention, not to the upholstery, but to the lines of the chair. However exotic the material showed your wealth, it was very much a minimal effect. So a bright, beautiful silk. But nevertheless, it was the chair lines that, that, that had to, to, to hold power to show how expensive the cabinet work had been, the chair making had been. The 19th century chairs are sprung under the rail to accommodate the newly invented coil springs, right. copper or steel springs, after 1825. Okay. Boing, boing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so to keep them all together, they put tufts in you know, to keep them in place, and just to make it look rather decorative. And suddenly it got deeper and deeper, deeper. and more and more and more, until it looked, most of the chairs looked like a marshmallow on legs with dimples in, you know. But very comfortable. Very comfortable, but very 19th century. It didn't happen before. And they stuffed it with horsehair, didn't they? They stuffed the chairs with horsehair? Well, that, that's another thing, that, a, a quality to look at, because in the best workshops, they were hand-sewn, still hand-sewn horsehair. But in the cheaper workshops, or the, the, the workshops producing less expensive furniture, of course, they'd use anything. Infected straw, stuff off the workshop floor, old newspapers, anything. Yeah. It wasn't meant to last. Highly flammable. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. And it rotted. It got woodworm, it got diseased. And until, really, until the 1950s, I remember, going to places where the family had dug a hole in the garden and thrown all the old furniture in. Oh, it was all rotten. Yeah. But just think what they might have put in there as well. Yeah. Oh, 
Can you imagine? Wouldn't it have been wonderful? Go along and sp spy something. Yeah. Just take that out. Nice I'll give you Georgian that. piece I'll there. Well, they're chucking it all away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We don't get that nowadays. No. <laughs> anyway, there is a little one, a pretty little piece of furniture. Again, mid Victorian period, 1865. After that book was published, obviously. And tell the viewer quickly what, what a whatnot was used for. Well, a whatnot was used for exactly that. Anything you wanted to. They were, they were absolutely devoted to, to collecting things. And you would put on there all your little objects from your travels. Because travel had just become fashionable and cheap enough by rail. Of course, you could now go on holiday and you could go to Scarborough or wherever. And you'd buy a little bit of Goss China from Scarborough and put it on there. And then it, it, it sort of took over and people would go to their local shop where you could buy presents from all over the world. Mm. So that would be covered with bits from China, from Japan. <laughs> I've got, and you know I live in Tring, right? I've got an Austrian plate, it says made in Austria, right? It says, with a photograph, it says a present from Tring. <laughs> and it was bought in Scarborough. <laughs> and that's because, yeah. Everything so, was shipped in. A, a whatnot would be covered with uh, memorabilia okay. from wherever you'd been. 